So I called Dr. Manning that next morning and I said, I accept. He said, good, go underneath the 6th South Bridge and as far as you can go, go over the railroad tracks. I really don't have an address, just keep following them. As I pulled up as far as I could go, I looked to my left and I couldn't see a school. I saw 12 boxcars scattered in the dirt. And I said to myself, you're lost. Get on a different street. Well, just as I was thinking about turning, I looked through the corner of my eye and a 13-year-old boy jumped out of a boxcar, ran right in front of my parked car, and he began to tie his shoelace. I rolled the window down just a little bit and I was going to say, hey, buddy, do you know where a school is? When this young man stood and he glared at me with the most amazing hatred. I panicked and I said, don't run him over. Just turn the car the other way and just make sure you don't run him over. Well, I watched the children in the classroom that day and for that next week, the next few weeks. And that one little boy that was kneeling before my car that morning, the first day, jumped out at me like crazy. Whenever he believed it was recess, he would stand up and say, recess, and the entire class would leave. And when we were out to recess and a toddler was yelling, I'm hungry, please feed me, Zachary would leave the area, take the child over to the table and feed them. Zachary was beautiful, he was bright, he clearly had leadership skills, and he was tender. He just had one very weird flaw. He hated me. Every day when everybody left the classroom, he would wait. Then he would walk up to me and with a very gentle shove, not a physical, painful shove, but a very disrespectful shove, he would shove me in the shoulder, look me right in the eye and say, go home, we don't need you. I'd had it one day. I grabbed him by his hand and I said, get in my room right now. He sat in my chair. He put his cowboy boots up on my desk. He said, what do you want, teach? I said, Zachary, this is killing me. I can't live like this. I can't live outside this classroom. It's too scary. I need your help. He said, I'll be your, I will be a good student for you, Miss Stacy, but do not ask me to be your friend. I'm not interested in that. We shook hands and he got ready to leave. And then I grabbed him one more time. Zach? What happened to you? If you will stand next to me every morning and allow me to settle you down, I'll run my hands up and down your back until you slow down. I will give you the grand prize. At the end of two weeks, all you have to do is communicate with me. At the end of two weeks, Alex pounded on my desk and he said, Teacher, I did it. I have been so good these last two weeks. I said, yes, what would you like? He said, let me tell you first, if anybody can pull this off, you can. Miss Stacy, I would like to meet Carl Malone. I said, oh, Alex, honey, I don't know him. He said, Miss Stacy, really, if anybody can pull this off, you can. My heart was just sick. This kid had had so many letdowns in life and here I was gonna do it again. So I called my friend Judy that night and I said, hey, Judy, you got to help me. I don't, I don't know what else to do. She said, I may have a contact. You try to just stay calm and I will write a letter. Within about 72 hours of Mr. Malone receiving his letter, Alex and I were standing in the far side of the lobby, looking at all six foot nine of Carl Malone's body. I remember Alex and I were holding hands. Because Alex was on my left, I can also remember that Alex looked up at me and he said, Teacher, stop shaking right now. I said, Alex, look at him. He's huge. He said, Teacher, he's a regular man. Just walk up to him. So I walked up to Mr. Malone and I held my hand out. And I noticed my hand was equal to his belly button, which was actually equal to my nose. And I gathered my senses as hard as I could and I said, Mr. Malone, my name is Stacy Bess. I operate the school here. And Mr. Malone, you have no idea the impact you are going to make today. The truth was, I had no idea. 
Mr. Malone reached down, grabbed me by the hand, and he stood and looked me right in the eyes and said, Miss Stacy, I know who you are. You and I have spoken in different conferences together, and I know that you don't know that I stay and hear you speak, but I've watched you hear me speak too. I said, Mr. L Malone, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. Would there be any possibility you would do seven or eight minutes of your speech in front of my students about the power of school? I wish you all could have been there with me that day as I learned one of the greatest lessons of life. Mr. Malone, in a very soft voice, said, Miss Stacy, I did not come here today to hide behind my uniform. I do not want to come today and be Carl Malone, the all-star basketball player. Miss Stacy, I know what those kids need, and I know you know it too. Please let me be Uncle Carl. I don't want to hide behind my credentials. Ladies and gentlemen, I followed Mr. Malone to the top of the stairs, and I leaned against those bookcases, and I cried and cried and cried. As I watched all six foot nine of him plop himself down on the floor, lean his back against a desk, and 25 little people and big people climbed all over his body. They measured his toes. They measured his feet. They laughed together so hard as I sobbed leaning against the bookcases. Mr. Malone looked over at me and he said, Miss Stacy, do you always cry like this? Well, I only cry like that when I'm learning some of life's most important lessons. Don't hide behind your credentials. Ladies and gentlemen, you've, you and I have gotten into this business because of our degrees, because of our experience and what we're good at. But we are not remembered for those. We are remembered for our humanity. Carl Malone, the bachelor, all-star basketball player taught me, get down on the floor and be a human being. Thank you for not hiding behind your credentials. Thank you for getting down on the floor and sneaking us in the back door to eat pudding with you. I did not understand the power that Mackenzie and I had until I began reading out of a journal entry. And I'm going to close with that. This journal entry was given to me by a little girl who was asked to write about what makes her happy. And I really thought she would write about all the fun things we could do together in the summer. But I want you to know what she wrote amongst 13 other children who wrote about the same subject. This little girl's job in life was to walk her mom and daddy to the liquor store every day, make sure they finished their bottle, and by her account, make sure they found the right house to go into. Here is what she wrote. My teacher, she is funny. You can just tell by the way she kisses her all over and leaves lipstick marks on her head. Watching her makes me happy. But ladies and gentlemen, what I really wanted you to hear is what she wrote at the bottom of the page in big, bold letters. I wish somebody would love me like that, especially when I was little. So in one short line, this lonely little girl echoes the aching, longing wish of every one of our children. And heck, let's be honest, every one of us, to be loved completely, and to be loved unconditionally. Ladies and gentlemen, you are in the best business in the whole world. When you invest in a child and teach them to find their own successes and their own happiness, you help their family succeed and you build stronger communities. Thank you for having me.